interaction I had with the university because of the limited post to the contents and especially to the methods um, in which the the teaching was uh, was being uh, realized. And um, I was always um, at odds with the traditional deductive methods of sociology that uh, pretended to see reality from the point of view of concepts and uh, tried to fit realities to concepts. And obviously that led to gross um, misrepresentations of reality. So I started with uh, understanding uh, research as um, a craft, no? Artesanía intelectual, an intellectual craftsmanship. And that's where, where I discovered that many uh, young students who were from uh, rural and Aymara origins had uh, serious difficulties in dealing, dealing with the jungle of concepts and theories that were so abstract that they couldn't possibly connect it with their lived experience. On the other hand, they had a keen uh, perceptive capacities uh, in their uh, gaze and in their gesture so they could at the same time understand a world that was hostile to them and also uh, uh, confront it in a creative way without uh, clashing uh, dangerously into um, untenable positions. So um, uh, these uh, Aymara people of my classes taught me that I should pay more attention to the gays and so I started with this uh, seminary of um, intellectual craftsmanship and turned it into a sociology of the image seminar, where at the end of the course, which was a semester course, more or less 16 weeks, uh, the students had to present a visual essay uh, combining words and images so that the words do not explain the image or the image do not just illustrate the words. So it was like a contra counterpoint of um, uh, image and text. And so, uh, but the course was despised by other professors who were more theoretically minded like Alvaro Garcia Linera, a Marxist, uh, who thought it was like just a a, a frivolous game of, of uh, little images and the students who were uh, his uh, uh, followers uh, who engaged in my course eventually presented very ridiculous uh, pretty pictures type of essay that, which didn't uh, reveal any kind of sensibility and nor any reading of the methodological texts that is, are very abundant in my course. So that was a, the way in which first the, the course got marginalized. They, thought, they told me I couldn't teach Sociología de la Imagen, so I had to, to go back to another course of which I had a, a tenure, which was uh, some kind of history of Bolivia. And so the course initially was reduced to the summer uh, courses, so it took just one month, and it really was deprived of all its potentialities. And um, uh, so I decided to take it away from the university. Uh, I had to uh, claim for a retirement before I was I was due because I couldn't get a permission to leave to teach in NYU. So I had to uh, become a, uh, a pensioned person uh, with a little, very little income. Um, but then we started with El Tambo Colectivo, which was a way to radicalize and put into practice fully the tenets in uh, both theoretical or methodological 
of the sociology of the image approach. So the first thing was to connect body and mind, to connect doing and thinking. And so that's where all the uh, manual work uh, was giving shape to uh, this uh, new approach that was called then uh, the sociology of the image. In reality, it started with a project for an exhibit in the Museo San Reina Sofia in Madrid, which uh, we retired and we're, were dissident and we published a catalog that revealed our view of the syncretic religion that in the in the circuit around Lake Titicaca uh, guided all the perception of the supernatural uh, combined with the power of the new god which was silver and Potosi. And, and from then, then on we decided to put into practice the um, the actual joining in uh, the material and the spiritual, the hand work and the mental work uh, in a Cheche way. So we wouldn't get into this contradiction. We also tried not so successfully to do a Cheche alliance between uh, men and women, you know, to, to uh, make a tissue of contentious creative uh, friction. Um, but it kind of scared the, the male, the, the group of, of males in, in our group. So it's like you now we are in a special standby situation. But anyhow, you know, uh, the thing was that also we were trying to join philosophy with food, for example. Uh, we created a, a restaurant, a service, a, a food service that is called El Apio del Pueblo, no? In vez de El Opio del Pueblo. Uh, to design this uh, irreverent idea of feeding people with our own hands. And so every Saturday we have a fair um, producers of, uh, of uh, very nice organic uh, 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 vegetables, uh, etc., mm, uh, come every Saturday to El Tambo and we cook a meal and we sell the dishes. And so that, you know, the auto uh, self sustainable way of dealing with the market. So we go to the market, we sell our things, we also sell mm, a cartonera type of books that are handmade and many other uh, manual uh, results of the manual work we do um, with uh, all kinds of materials, plastic bags and all that we usually knit with them. And so we make all kinds of um, gestures uh, into a more wide, into a wider preoccupation because ours is a micro-political approach. You know, we cannot change the world, but we can change ourselves and we can ir irradiate the, uh, the energy of self-sustainance to our neighbors, which are the best customers of, of the organic eco fair that we have in El Tambo every Saturday. And in the afternoons, we have a uh, more of feed for the soul, food for the soul. So we, we have usually a fair of fanzines and uh, publications and uh, t-shirts and all kinds of manual things, you know? Uh, and so we also so sell our vegetables. Now it's approaching the tumbo, uh, uh, Harvest, no? Uh, tumbo is, is called, uh, oh, what is it called in Colombia? Curuba, no? Uh, so it's a very delicious plant and we have lots of it. We also have kale and, and all kinds of uh, vegetables. Uh, and a famous locoto, very, very, uh, uh, very hot uh, pepper, no? 
And so we go on into the possibility of self-sustenance through also the courses. So twice a year for one month each time, we have La Catedra Libre, the, the free university, which is where I teach Sociología de la Imagen with all its practical and corporal implications which are impossible to do in the university. So we combine also work in the, in the orchards and, and uh, doing photographs outside and um, knowing uh, people like this year, there was a essay on the albañilas, the, the women uh, masons that are now very strong and have their own unions. And uh, also another about the Chicani, the, the producers of organic uh, vegetables. So um, the, the course also gives people the opportunity to be here for one full month. It's not like in many universities, a terrible uh, uh, new thing is that they give courses for three days. In the fourth day, you have to take an exam to 40 people, and then you give grades, and they get, they get credit for that ridiculous course. So I think a decent course should give you time from session to session to read. So uh, the course is Monday, um, Wednesday, and Friday. So uh, for a full month, so it's 12 sessions, each has three, three hours, and on Saturdays and Sundays, we do uh, extra aula, you know, extra classroom work. So it's a, a full experience because people come from Brazil, Chile, Argentina, Colombia, Ecuador, uh, Mexico, and sometimes even from Europe, uh, people who are Latinos who live in the U US or in Europe. So it's a very rich experience because they have to form affinity groups like in the anarchist uh, style, you know, so affinities of style, of uh, approach, of aesthetics. Uh, among people who are very diverse in terms of nationality, they have never met themselves. So by the second week, everybody's a friend. They have got in, in the nights to nightclub, they have the gotten drunk, they have made friends. So it becomes a very uh, pleasant experience. No? And in the third week, they have to consolidate their project and start working on it. And the final day is a big party because it, it begins with the exposure of the work of uh, visual essays for uh, every group of affinity, more or less four or five groups are formed in every seminar. So finally, and also together with this central seminar, uh, there are two other seminars which are obligatory. O sea, forcefully you have to choose one of them. This year there were three. So you have to choose choose another one in order to be accepted in the course. Uh, one was a, a course on anarchism that was in charge of uh, Virginia Aguillon. Uh, and another one was about culturas alimentarias by Rosa Quiroga, who, who is uh, um, doing her PhD thesis on um, precisely the uses um, and cultures of, of food among Bolivian migrants in Argentina, in Cordoba. So she's uh, now working very hard in um, connecting cons uh, consumers with producers and escaping the link of, because these women were complaining that they were thrown out violently from other markets where they tried to install themselves very early in the morning. So they were, you know, harassed and they found this place, which is very central because it's near Mercado Strongest, a very traditional market in a popular region, zone of La Paz, a neighborhood. Name, name Tembladerani. Uh, so it's a very, very rich experience of making a link 
with transnational networks in the course and with national networks um, based on food um, from producers to consumers uh, through uh, elaboration of various um, uh, prepared dishes. Huh? So now we have, uh, with every single um, uh, superavit that we have uh, each course, we decide to make investments. So now we are going to um, make an investment in uh, sound equipment because Yacu Perez, the indigenous candidate in Ecuador selections, uh, will come to Bolivia in April and will be in El Tambo giving a, a talk and we will suppose that it will be full of people. Uh, so, um, and we'll have to feed and give uh, drinks to a lot of people. Uh, so every time there is an um, academic event, we don't uh, feel embarrassed and at selling food and selling drinks, you know? So make, really make the possibility of a sustainable, uh, independent, autonomous uh, enterprise. Huh? That's what I could say about El Tambo. Maybe there are questions or... Gracias. Primero, súper contento y agradecido eh, de poder contar con Silvia Rivero Kosikansky aquí. Y la vacuna nos la impidió la vez pasada. Y como es muy refrescante escuchar un movimiento que no, quiere, que, que no trata de cambiar al mundo, ¿no? sino irradiar el cambio. El cambio. <coughs> porque en estos momentos todo el mundo quiere buscar la solución maestra. Y yo, yo quería preguntar desde esta visión del Ocheje, que se ve muy claramente en cómo opera el, el, el tambo, esta idea de hacer y aprender, y seguramente el sentir por ahí se cruza. Si, si puede ver, doña Silvia, desde estas geografías, desde el Ab, Abyayala, Entendiendo esto del cheje como esta, eh, sin, como, como esta contradicción que nunca hará síntesis, si puede haber como una nueva propuesta civilizatoria más abierta, más eh, multicultural, que pueda salir desde estos territorios, ¿no? un poco pensando en los movimientos de base que hay en América Latina, si hay algo que de ahí podría pues servir de inspiración, como, como nos dice que es el movimiento del tambo, para, para otros <coughs> movimientos en el mundo que están buscando hacerse la vida de otra manera, fuera de la modernidad. Bueno. Y ahora en inglés. I'm sorry. Um, uh, then you want uh, Yeyo to be translated to English? Is that, is that? Right. I could translate myself. I, I find it pretty lame that we're speaking in English as uh, someone that have a common language in Spanish, but it's okay. I was asking about how, first of all, I said it was very refreshing that we could uh, uh, hear someone or a movement that is not trying to change the world, but be the change they want to see in the world and irradiate from their inspiration for other movements. So from there, I ask if she could see some inspiration that from this concept of the Cheje could emerge from the Abyayala, from Latin America, uh, that could inspire other movements in the world that are trying to do the, the Buen Vivir, the, the, uh, finding their way of living outside of the modernity strains. Just, just, just one small thing, Silvia, sorry to interrupt. Um, People that want, when someone speaks in Spanish, Gerardo is doing the translation to English. So you can speak in English or Spanish. Happily we have Gerardo and he will also intervene. So please, you have two different channels down there. So yeah, you can speak in Spanish and Gerardo will do the translation. También tú Silvia, si quieres hablar en español, 
que salga como salga. No, no problem. I think that most of people uh, will understand better in English. So more or less as a response, I would stress the fact that micropolitics is a, is a politics of survival. It is to survive within this aggressive world of capital and state monopolies and um, uh, co-opting the people through um, gifts that really don't solve the problems of unemployment. Uh, and so everybody is like a rentist uh, dependent on the generosity of, of a paternal state. So to be away from that, is just to be in a very small place, a very circumscribed um, and temporary zone of freedom. It's a temporary autonomous zone as uh, uh, Hakim Bey has termed it, but it, for us it's a, a temporary uh, community, you know, a temporary, uh, it, it, it now my community is more or less 11 years old, but uh, it's still temporary. Now. The people who were there in the first years are not the same that are now. So we we always renew to say something. Um, and but the, the spirit of the collective uh, remains based in two basic um, like. Uh, affluence no uh, for one side anarchism and all its implications in terms of uh, a helpful relation to mother earth and autonomy and respect uh, for uh, minorities and all that and on the other hand uh, it is a community of feeling a community of that uh, communicates with the earth through a cycle of rituals. So it's obviously mm. a very stained anarchism. It's not pure. Uh, the anarchism where naturalists were anti-taste, uh, atheist, uh, but no, we do have a cult of the mountains and ceremonies to celebrate our position in the middle of the Andes, which is a very privileged place really you know we are facing the main mountain the the most sacred mountain of the whole andes in la paz so how can we be uh, indifferent to that energy no and also there is a lot of um, ceremonies in the city the city is surrounded by um uh, wakas or sites of, of ancestor cult and so there is a, we inhabit a sacred geography. And so it's an anarchist that is contaminated with um, spiritualism, with feminism, with ecology, you know, uh, and with Indianism, with the Indian uh, world that inhabits our own subjectivities. So I think it's a extremely important posture to revive the Indian uh, because the, the, the the European, we have already uh, over, an overgrown European and a diminished Indian. So we do have to uh, propulse or impulse um, the um, flourishing of this Indian identity in terms of language, of creativity. Uh, my writing, for example, is quite Cheche because I sub many fundamental um, concepts are are from taken from Aymara and they are in a way uh, for some purist Aymara linguists are outrageous because it's a, a I use a me, I make a metaphorical use of the concept because it has been deprived through history uh, through extirpation of idolatries through negation of the epistemological uh, um, uh, basis of the Andean way of thinking, uh, that they have stripped all the metaphorical value of concepts. So Cheche remains a descriptive concept of certain types of 
um, lamps or cows or llamas that have mixed colors, no? But from that restricted point, I enlarge it to the idea of a Cheche identity, which is made up of contradictory colors or contradictory identities that seemingly form a third color, the mestizo, but actually are constantly in opposition. And also the idea of friction. See, you cannot just collide with the other with all, all of its uh, interferences and aristas and points. So there is a process of um, friction which uh, allows for electricity, for energy to come out. And that's a metaphorical, it's a concept metaphor to follow Gayatri Spivak's uh, idea of concepts, no? Uh, so, um, and also it's a concept, it's a practical concept. You live in a Chihi world, you create mm -hmm. a Chihi world. You write like a Chihi person. You think in a Chihi way. So uh, it imbues your whole attitude uh, with a different approach that is not contradiction, but it's agony, agonism, not antagonism, but agonism. It's recognizing the difference, but not fighting to suppress it. That's it. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, I will hand it to Gerardo. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm not in the main room. Yes, you are. Great. Silvia. Eh, sí. Pensaba también en cómo tú hablas de múltiples modernidades. Eh, también, particularmente en América Latina, eh, y hablando desde México, está mucho este binarismo de lo mestizo, de lo indígena, eh, y lo cheje permite ir como mucho más allá de ese binarismo para iniciar estas modernidades eh, múltiples, enraizadas, manchadas, eh, que eh, permiten también de alguna manera escapar, eh, reconocer las identidades, pero no quedarse atrapado en estos eh, esencialismos. Entonces, ¿qué, qué, ¿qué rol ves tú o qué papel ves tú o qué posibilidades eh, acerca de el reconocer que no existe eh, una sola modernidad, que no existe una sola forma de procesar e integrar el, el mundo, de habitar el mundo, sino que lo que tenemos es una multiplicidad de mundos que están siendo constantemente actualizados desde esta micropolítica de lo cotidiano? Ajá. Bueno, la idea de modernidades múltiples tiene también que ver con la de multitemporalidades que destaca um, René Zabaleta con su concepto de abigarramiento, ¿no es cierto? Pero para él el abigarramiento es un estado imperfecto que no permite la plena realización del estado porque no permite la inteligibilidad de lo homogéneo. No permite la inteligibilidad de lo homogéneo. Eileen, sorry, sorry, just a minute. Eileen, can you put Gerardo uh, with translation? Uh, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. Okay, I'll, no. I'll, I'll reassume. So you, you can do it in uh, Spanish because it's more beautiful. But if you want to share it in English, the only you question. Can me to speak in Spanish or in English? Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> ya bueno, entonces, como les digo. Para Zabaleta era un estado imperfecto porque impedía la constitución de un estado moderno que suponía una cuota de inteligibilidad y de homogeneidad y por eso lo abigarrado era un estado transitorio, en tanto que para mí no lo es, es más bien una gran potencia de reestructuración. Ay, se me está acabando la batería, voy a enchufar mi compu. Entonces, un poco mi propuesta es que um, hemos, eh, lejos de ver a uh, lo indígena como si estuviera allá lejos y hace tiempo, tenemos que 
movernos en la contemporaneidad con el otro indígena. Y esa contemporaneidad hace un tiempo eh, eh, hay una articulación en el presente de sintagmas de diversos pasados que coexisten entre sí. Entonces, de esa manera, el presente es una especie de unidad sintagmática de la diversidad que coexiste de un modo constante, ¿no? O sea, todo el tiempo estamos haciendo cosas que nos vinculan con el pasado, de las que a veces no somos conscientes, ¿no? Comer chuño, por ejemplo, es remontarse a miles de años de domesticación de la papa, de domesticación de las alturas, porque si bien la papa proviene de variantes eh, silvestres de la Amazonía, al subir el problema es que tiene el problema de la helada y tiene el problema de, la, de que se vuelve amarga. Entonces, la forma de quitar eso es hacer chuño. Entonces, todos esos inventos que hoy día comemos como lo más normal nos remiten a un pasado remoto. Para no hablar de actitudes personales, hay actitudes racistas hoy día que recuerdan a elementos del, de, del siglo XVI, ¿no? Hay actitudes populistas en el actual régimen que son idénticas a las del MNR. ¿no? no es que la historia se repita tal cual, pero se reactiva, se reactualizan viejas formas de dominación bajo nuevos ropajes retóricos. Eso. No sé si te he respondido con eh, Gerard. Ya. Yeah. Claro, el otro tema que toca eh, en ese terreno es mostrar cómo las élites siempre buscan una modernidad mimética, imitativa, pastiche de lo externo, ¿no? Y niegan la modernidad propia del periodo anterior. O sea, las élites movimentistas se alzan contra las élites cholas para volverlas mestizas, para domesticarlas. ¿no? Eh, negando, digamos, su propulsión propia que está basada en redes de parentesco, en relaciones rituales a lo largo de toda una amplia cadena de localizaciones geográficas y sociales. ¿no? Entonces, las élites siempre tratan como de aplastar esa eh, diversidad negándola. ¿no? Es una incomodidad permanente. Y por otro lado, se, eh, se reproduce a través de esa actitud iconoclasta de, de, de no aceptar esa, ese destino mojo se reproduce también eh, eh, las identidades subalternas. ¿no? Eh, Andrés, eh, quería... Sí, hola. Sí, mira, eh, um, bueno, pues, I'm going to take a in Spanish because I don't feel comfortable with English and this, but thank you for all. Um, um, decía que agradecer a, a Silvia este, ha sido una inspiración para mí en trabajos, trabajo yo en Chiapas con profesores y, este, y quisiera aprovechar el momento para agradecer la inspiración en, con, su, con, con su trabajo. Eh, y porque he tratado de compartir estas ideas de cómo vamos este tratando de irrumpir en las, en las formas de dominación que hay en nuestro trabajo pedagógico, en el aula, ¿no? Este, y me he encontrado con, con que a veces que, que resulta para nosotros profesores este, bastante complicado porque una cosa es la arena dentro de la universidad y ahí hay un montón de formas de reproducción de, de estas este, desigualdades y diferencias, pero fuera de la universidad también, pues como, en cómo nos alimentamos, cómo vestimos, en cómo cómo nos relacionamos con los demás, incluso los movimientos en los que a veces nos metemos, este, formamos parte, ¿no? que, que los compañeros profesores y profesoras lo hacen. Entonces aquí yo quisiera este, compartir, preguntarte, Silvia, si, si, si tú ves esta, esta lucha este, abigarrada de, de micropolítica que implica no luchar contra las diferencias, pero ser consciente de sus contradicciones que nos habitan, eh, ¿Y qué tanto te parece a ti que eso implica 
ir uh, deconstruyendo las instituciones ¿no? con las que hemos estado este, acostumbrados en la modernidad este, que vivimos, ¿no? la universidad, el Estado, el, el, las agencias, etc. Porque también, por otro lado, hay que construir alteridades. ¿no? Entonces, no sé cómo veas esta dificultad de estar deconstruyendo lo instituido, pero construyendo nuevas, nuevas posibilidades. ¿no? Bueno, en general... Los estudiantes que vienen a mi curso de Sociología de la Imagen tienen grandes decepciones con la academia. Están a punto de abandonar. Pero yo soy de la idea de que, bajo un principio anarquista elemental, que cada quien debe hacerse responsable de las consecuencias de sus elecciones. Y si han elegido estudiar, tienen que atenerse a las limitaciones y a las posibilidades de la institución que han escogido. Entonces, sí es necesario para equilibrar esa frustración tener un pie afuera en la universidad, sea en el apoyo a los movimientos sociales, en el trabajo voluntario o en el trabajo intelectual autónomo como el que tenemos en el tambo. Entonces, a muchos de los decepcionados de la academia que vienen a mi curso, yo los insto a volver, pero con astucia, con la capacidad de parodiar las reglas rígidas para pasarlas por alto y ejercer un ámbito de libertad y de osadía que normalmente les, les parece difícil, o sea, los impulso a ser inteligentemente contestatarios. Pero no a, a abandonar la U. Gracias. Ni como estudiante ni como docente. Sí, claro, pues para los profesores resulta a veces, pues, ¿cómo nos vamos a mantener? Muchos me dicen, Ay, vamos solo a, a, a abrazar la lucha. Otro problema es pues con los consultores estatales. Ya esos tipos se fregaron porque quieren, ya esos tipos no pueden volver al candor, a la inocencia que requiere una aproximación libre de prejuicios con la realidad, sobre todo con la realidad multietnica, ¿no? Eh, hola, yo también quiero hacer una pregunta, solo voy a hacer una aclaración eh, para Gerardo. Eh, Gerardo, vamos a cambiar de traducción. El, otra persona lo va a hacer porque no está funcionando bien tu audio. Just, sí, entonces... Eh, Eileen, can you, can you add to Joel, sí. please? Like yeah, Joel is there. Yes, Hopefully it'll you. be better, everyone. Thanks for preparing. Yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yo tenía una pregunta, Silvia, muchas gracias por, por estar aquí. El, pensando como que en, en todo este tema de lo que proponemos en la conferencia es reimaginar la educación. Y pues, como el Gerardo te ha contado, de Ecoversidades es un espacio que se propone en la idea de reclamar eh, la sabiduría de los territorios, como, como no decir, bueno, ahora tenemos otra estructura y esta es la nueva, sino decir, cuéntame qué sucede en tu, en tu territorio y qué hay, ¿no? Y la experiencia que tú nos propones eh, del tambo y, y, y toda la construcción que hay alrededor de eso con, con el colectivo Cheje, plantea justo eso, ¿no? Y, y yo, yo estoy en Ecuador, yo estoy en Quito y estoy en los Andes, en las montañas. Y me pregunto, como, y esta sería la pregunta, como, ¿cómo, ¿cómo ves tú dentro del espacio académico? Como lo que intenta esta conferencia también es ser un puente entre lo académico y lo, y lo no académico en el sentido formal. Porque no, hay muchas formas de aprender, pero al no tener las palabras adecuadas, entre comillas, de, del espacio académico, no están legitimadas, ¿no? Entonces, como que hay todo un trabajo dentro de los territorios súper bonito de, de ver cómo se legitiman de cierta forma, de acompañarse, de estar ahí como para, para escucharse. Y mi pregunta es porque en, en, en mi territorio, en los Andes, eh, en los Andes de ecuatorianos, con, con, acá con, con lo quichua, eh, tenemos también como los hermanos colombianos, digamos, hay, hay ciertas prácticas, te voy a poner dos ejemplos, como... El, el hablar con las montañas, el tener como, como, como nuestros maestros a las montañas o a una medicina ancestral, por ejemplo, como la ayahuasca, que son, eh, son es lo no humano. Como, ¿cómo, cómo, ¿Cómo tú ves dentro del espacio académico y dentro de tu práctica eh, 
es, ¿cómo, ¿cómo se hace puente, digamos, entre estas, estas prácticas, estos maestros que están dentro de nuestros territorios y, y, y lo académico? O sea, ¿cómo les contamos que, 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 que la claro. montaña es nuestro maestro? O sea, que, que la universidad... Claro, es es decir, yo, he definido, yo he definido la episteme indígena no por el color de la piel, no por los vestidos, no por la opresión, etcétera, sino por varios elementos um, constitutivos. Por ejemplo, en primer lugar, el considerar humanos, eh, es decir, el, el considerar sujetos a entidades no humanas, los cerros, los ríos, las montañas, los bosques, a, a sacralizar lugares, animales, etcétera. ¿no? Um, en segundo lugar, es un espacio cultural en el que los muertos viven. ¿ah? Los muertos vuelven a la tierra, cada todo santo, ¿no? En tercer lugar, eh, se, eh, está basada eh, la noción de lo andino en la comunidad, o sea, en la tendencia a construir o reconstruir o inventar comunidad. ¿ya? Es lo que se llama la comunalidad, ¿ya? Y finalmente, yo creo que es necesario aprender un idioma indígena porque es aprender otro molde conceptual para entender el mundo y las relaciones. ¿ya? El hecho, por ejemplo, de que, eh, contrario a lo que piensa eh, Rodolfo Kush, eh, ser y estar no son verbos que existen en Aymara. ¿Ah? Son sufijos, no son verbos. ¿ya? Entonces, puedes estar un ratito, para eso hay un sufijo. Puedes estar mucho rato, para eso hay otro sufijo. Y puedes estar, eh, eh, no siempre, pero soler estar. Puedes soler estar permanentemente. O sea, el momento en que sueles estar en el lugar, ya eres de ese lugar. Eso le viene re bien a los migrantes. Entonces, eh, pues tiene muchos elementos eh, gramaticales, conceptuales, que enriquecen mucho el pensamiento, ¿no? Entonces, eh, por eso yo pienso que es posible aprender a indianizarse, porque además te hace indio no solamente la sangre, te hace indio el paisaje, te hace indio la relación con el mundo de lo indio que te rodea en los mercados, en las propias casas, a través de las nanas. Lo, lo indio te, está en tu entorno y está en tu interior, en tus recuerdos más remotos. No creo que haya nadie en ningún país de América Latina que no haya ido nunca a un mercado, que no haya nunca escuchado una lengua indígena. ¿no? En el aeropuerto de Bogotá, Encuentro a dos personas hablando quechua. Eran los inganos del sur de Colombia, ¿no? Entonces, hay toda una transformación de identidad que tiene que ver con esto de asumir elementos de la episteme que antes se pensaban como atrasados. Por ejemplo, la crisis ecológica global es un llamado pues a todos los saberes que ayudan a sanar a la tierra. O sea, una tierra tan destruida, tan herida, tan dañada por los humanos, que los humanos también tienen que buscar recursos para perdonarse con ella y sanarla, ¿no? Eso. ¿Quién más? Propongan preguntas. ¿Qué come Silvia? <ríe> Udi, Udi. Hi, uh, Silvia. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What a, what a delight to finally meet you and hear your words. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going I'm to speak in, in English. Um, so I, um, my kind of question reflection, and, and thank you for sharing some of the journey um, of you from being within the system to feeling something that we've experienced too, many of us 
probably in the Alliance can speak to that, that being the system is very inhospitable to these other ways of being, knowing, doing, uh, and relating that we, we're trying to cultivate and, um, uh, and connect to these deeper aspects of life and what it is to be human and to relate to the, to the more than human. Um, but one, one big challenge, as you mentioned, of, of being outside the system, uh, you, you talked about that these are very temporary autonomous zones uh, in lots of different ways, uh, politically, but also economically in terms of people's livelihoods and, and so forth. So um, a kind of a question with that is, in your experience, the, also what is the, the Chehe relationship to uh, the autonomous, to, to the mainstream? Because if you think about, I mean, I, I was just reflecting now as you're saying that, um, uh, you know, as, as uh, Andre was sharing that in, in the Alliance, the things that we've been experimenting and we're committed to, it, it feels very, um, like we, we are created this kind of autonomous ways of relating and being and sharing knowledge and practice be, between territories. And although, you know, we've been going for around seven years and we can say there's like a few hundred amazing projects around the world that are connected. Uh, if you think about the scale of uh, mainstream universities around the world, you're talking about millions and millions of, uh, of faculty and hundreds of millions of students that go through these, these, uh, these institutions uh, all around the world. And to very extents, the, the mainstream university still has a very important role for, for creating spaces of critical thought and reflection and uh, uh, in, in places that sometimes that might be one of the few places where, where that happens. So I, I just wondered uh, through your experience of being in the system and being out of the system, what are your thoughts about um, these questions of autonomy, uh, sustain economic livelihoods and sustainability? And also this question of, it, it, there's, it seems like an increasing urgency about the crises that we're facing with uh, the destruction of biodiversity, with climate crisis, with the Anthropocene more generally, and the, the, uh, the scale of the solutions or the scale of the transformations, I guess, that are needed feels like, you know, we really have a, a very narrow window to begin deep, deep transformation to the, you know, the worst aspects of this. So uh, I just wondered if you had any reflections about autonomy and relation to mainstream around these kinds of things that we are collectively trying to work on. Thanks. Okay, let me tell you that I have an advantage. Um, I, I am 33 years old and I am pensioned by the university. Uh, by no means uh, uh, I am uh, uh, affluent with that uh, money. I barely uh, meet make the ends meet. But that means I am not really autonomous um, because my livelihood doesn't depend entirely on um, self-sustainable activities. I do contribute to them through the courses, which are very uh, useful for uh, making me even my budget. But uh, I don't accept any kind of consultancy, especially with the state, you know, even though the state pays my, my pension, I feel that is my right. You know, it's not any sellout to the state. But um, I think it is difficult to extend this idea to other places where there's plenty of work. You know? In the US, you know, there's plenty of work opportunities that is constantly absorbing labor force from all over the world. Whereas in my country, you know, it's unemployment is rampant and it's only disguised by this paternal uh, giving out of the bonuses you know, for survival of the people. You know, so as a society, we are not self-sustainable. Huh? We import more, most of our food, even potatoes, which Bolivia is one of the places of origin of potatoes, we import. So for decades, even for centuries, Bolivia has uh, depend on 
prime materials, you know, raw materials that were exported raw. You know? It was first the silver, then tin, then um, uh, caucho, then uh, uh, petroleum, gas, and, and cocaine. So all these export booms, the only industrial one is cocaine, for obvious reasons, not the best example of industrialization. So uh, we remain with uh, a society that has depended a lot um, on state um, generosity, philanthropy you know, of the worst paternal kind, because it comes with the humiliating requirement of political support for the government. So if you receive a bonus, you ought to support the government. So those are the deals of uh, recycled uh, patron client relations that come from the, all the way from the colonial period. That's it. Okay, maybe Luna. Yes. Okay. So, uh, bienvenidos, Sylvia. Um, I am in a course right now in my institution that's alternative epistemologies, and we are reading your book. Uh, the on practices and discourses of decolonization this week, and we meet next week. And what I'm fascinated by is that you present narrative ch challenges to the conception of mestizaje and and uh, and hybridity uh, as uh, really not being liberatory, right? And you offering new theorization of complex racial configurations. And I would love for you to elaborate a little further because we have Gloria Anzadua's work about mestizaje here and, and, and what she has left legacy wise. And I wanna share this with my class next week. So, so thank you. Okay. Well, I think um, uh, it's a very inspiring, the work by Gloria Anzaldúa, um, the borderlands, the new mestiza. And if you see in the course of the work, it's a juxtaposition, not a fusion of uh, various identities, the identity as a Chicana uh, with its indigenous roots, its Spanish colonial roots, and being a woman and a lesbian, in the border, no? I also um, took that um, idea for a book of mine that is called Coca Borderlands, Las Fronteras de la Coca, no? So I do think that to question the mestizaje as fusion and hybridity allows us to see the contradiction that the idea of hybridity tends to deny and to deny the contradiction does not mean to erase them out of existence because the contradictions will still be there and will be like Ernest Bloch um, sees them. Um, um, uh, the fury, you know, will, will explode with fury in the present if those contradictions are not adequately de dealt with consciously in the present. So it, it, that's what happened with the a deep anti-Semitist uh, tradition of the Sambito dances uh, in the Middle Ages in Germany. And so he saw all that as fruit of these uh, undigested contradictions, you know, that remain there like a volcano and they, uh, you know, violently show up in moments of crisis. So I think to deal with this desire as contradiction, without a synthesis doesn't mean to doom it to uh, violence and, uh, and war, you know? On the contrary, it means to, uh, the society uh, should be conscious of these contradictions within each subjectivity because colonialism is not 
something that unites one homogeneous entity called the colonizer with another homogeneous entity called the colonized. The idea of internal colonialism for me is more valid than the idea of coloniality because colonialism is a process and is uh, susceptible to internalization. O sea, colon internal colonialism is also internalized colonialism. When the subject opts to obey the dominant and submit his own subaltern subjectivity. I don't know if that helps. He, I had a lot of inspiration from Ernest Bloch, uh, from Franz, Franz Fanon. Uh, Michelle, would you like to ask your question? Thanks. Um, hello, Sylvia. I'm I'm from Cape Town in South Africa, and uh, I'm deeply grateful and for your for your insights that you shared today. And I am still in the university in the sociology department, where I teach ecological sociology. Um, and in in the space in South Africa, uh, since 2015, there's a openness to conversations about decoloniality and um, in this university space with all its struggles and contradictions. Um, so I find it intriguing that you just your your, st your story and about how you were in a sense blocked um, in the sociology department by Marxists and in South Africa were also still dominated by the sort of right and left politics. I'm wondering, after 11 years and you're moving out and starting these initiatives um, outside the sort of outside the capitalist logics um, and this sort of resistance, is there a more sense of an openness to um, the, the concepts and the ideas that you brought around the sociology of the image, the more than human worlds um, in Bolivia? Because a lot of, the 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 scholars Minolo and Escobar and Goodness and um, write so favorably read Beyond Viver um, and you know everything that's happening in Bolivia and Peru but uh, but yeah so so I so I still I mean so I, I feel a little bit astonished um, about your story and, and I'm wondering yeah is there a, a convergence and a shift. Well, I, I'm not sure I did understand you fully. Mm, I think the idea of che I thought that the idea of the Cheche identity as a solution um, for the um, um, the encubrimiento, the covering up that um, the traditional mestizaje meant as an homogeneous third new person who would be better than the two original opposers. So um, I did um, ask from Mestizaje uh, its contradictory nature that uh, we feel in the day to day life, you know, some people say when somebody's drunk and starts shouting and crying, etc., that he, le salió el indio, no? The Indian came out, no? So it's like a repressed Indian we have. So to understand mestizaje as a positive and also to make it a more positive as, as, as long as the more the Indian is elevated and dignified within the, the presence of these two opposers. So you have, uh, you have to radicalize both the, the, the European and the Indian because the European, the basic of the European is something very acceptable. The idea of human individual rights, human individual in the sense of uh, being a woman or being a lesbian or whatever identity you choose as, as an individual, it has to be respected. No, The idea of struggles for the dignity of work, all the anarchist experience comes from Europe. No, But you have to, like the freedom of choice, is all surrounded by um, superfluous 
uh, stuff. It has to be cleaned up, uh, so to speak. Um, from there, like uh, the, if your uh, if your right to choose uh, is reduced to choosing between Adidas or Calvin Klein, it's it's a ridiculous choice. But that's to what amounts the freedom of the market and the idea of free will. Um, but uh, so you have to, in a way, you know, radicalize uh, Europe's, um, you know, ideas um, in order to make them uh, more clearly opposed to the other side, which is the India, which is also to be radicalized. You have to, you know, begin by adopting this epistemic uh, idea that things are, things have, have agency, uh, are subject and mountains can talk, etc. No, and on the other hand, uh, you do believe, and we do make all the rituals to the ancestors every first and two of November, and All Saints Day, and uh, now we next. Uh, uh, I don't know, I think it's Thursday or Wednesday, we will do the Candelaria ritual. So we are permanently uh, feeding that Indian inside, making ourselves more conscious of the uh, devout um, attitude that we do have uh, in the rituals towards the mountains, towards the elements, no? towards the stars, the sun. So we get connected. Being in the city sometimes being means forgetting when is um, new moon or full moon. And those are important uh, issues when it comes to the right uh, moment for uh, sowing uh, certain plants. So the potato has to be sown when it's, uh, the moon is decreasing. You know, because and it's underground, and the other things like fava beans or peas have to be sold in the um, uh, growing season of the moon, when in the crescendo of the moon, because they they grow outside. So there's a lot of co correspondence between the cosmos and the day-to-day -day activities. I don't know if that answers your question. Thanks for that. I love the reminder <clears throat> that it's up to us how we orient to these bodies that are among us. Uh, okay, Palma, looks like you're... Yeah, wondering. I wanted to continue. Um, I thank you for, uh, so much for uh, this amazing uh, presentation. I just... I have a, like a problem with this uh, definition or stereotyped view also of Europe because I have a problem with decolonization in the meaning when it does not mean just breaking power schemes and we see power schemes or for example the existence of non-dualism also in Europe so I think that it was uh, that sentence about uh, the anarchists but then uh, stereotyping a bit Europe it really didn't fit with the with the cosmovision that was given until that moment. So I would like to, uh, if, she, if she could uh, uh, deepen a bit what she means with decolonization, because I have also a big conflict with the, these massive use of mainstream global south, global north, etc., which invisibilize the complexity of Europe and also the existence of indigeneity inside Europe, because if you are, for example, I'm Swiss Italian, my parents are from Southern Europe in Calabria, believe me, we have much more in common with the, with the indigenous people uh, in some tribes in Brazil or wherever than uh, with Germans, you know what I mean? So it's very easy to objectify uh, and entering these uh, also, dichotomization of global north, global south, which for me, it's more a matter of breaking power shifts. And uh, thank you for your presentation because your journey in academia is resonating with, with mine <laughs> so much. But then that last sentence, I was like, surprised me. 
Okay, I don't use the ideas of global south or global north. I no, think our, 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 our struggles are extremely localized, are extremely local in, in general. And we address the world that is within, that is within mm -hmm. our country, within our city, within ourselves. We address mm -hmm. a world that we know, you know, the unknown, the world what, that we don't know probably is what, uh, you know, the, the Arab world or, or those worlds of, that are so alien to our experience. So from that point of view, uh, I don't think, uh, obviously in Europe, there is the problem of colonialism towards the migrants from many places. But previously, you know, in the 19th century, Paris was a segregated city where there were you know, people from the South, from the North, from many uh, places that even spoke different languages like Lang uh, Languedoc, no? Entonces, there was an internal colonialism in Europe, uh, not to speak of the relations of coloniality between the powers of uh, banking um, uh, in Belgium. Yeah, but that Poland. speaking in and, the past is still incorrect, I think, because it's still a reality. No, no, it's but still, I think uh, the past it's still a very strong us. reality and it can't be invisibilized. What is in being invisibilized? Those dynamic of power schemes that exist in Europe as well as uh, in Latin America as well as because it's not it's not the same being from Kurdistan or from uh, you know what I mean no I think okay. we are I think the colonizations of Europeans is a problem of Europeans it's not our problem. It's our problem is to decolonize no, but I'm just ourselves. That it's, uh, and you no. should find the ways to decolonize yourself in your own ways, in your own terms, through your own memories. First of all, you are objectifying me. You don't know who, like the, the first thing I would like to say is like, I thought this is an international Congress. So there might be people from worldwide. And so I just, it resonates me because I found your presentation amazing and it makes all sense. I was just thinking that sometimes we put decolonialization, we expand this semantic of saying it's breaking power schemes of any type and not just seeing colonialism under the dynamic, no, Euro, uh, Latin America. In your, in your uh, conversation, yes, but there's also literature that expands this view. So I want to just to know if it was going in that line or not, okay? Because myself, I have struggled with these concepts because I would rather just use in a translocal approach, just talking about breaking power schemes, for example. But of course, in a very local narrative, can be colonialism, decolonizing, etc. I don't okay, know if I agree with you that that you can conceptualize the colonization in a different way than I do. Uh, I don't see why should there be only one definition of what is the colonization? Because no. it's a very experiential thing. There's no theory of the colonization. There was, you know, the experience of the colonization of Africa was then by Balandier or I don't know. I don't know whom in France was the theory of the, the colonization. That was a very arrogant uh, position because uh, you cannot theorize completely a very experiential situation where you judge from the results in your own subjectivity and your own uh, locality, but uh, you well, cannot develop a universal theory of the colonization. You can name it otherwise. Yeah, no, that's why it was like a proof that we are trapped into these terminologies. Okay. So, okay. Thank you so much. Sorry. It was very inspirational, your talk. I have another question. Andrea? Yeah. Yes, thank you. I have another question. Um, and it is related to like um, in, in, in to my territory, to Ecuador. My question is, um, so we, we struggle with this idea of mestizo. 
going to say it in Spanish, sorry. En español, perdón. El, va, lidiamos con este, gracias Joel, con la idea de lo mestizo. Y eh, en, en la ciudad, como la discusión eh, es, eh, incluso yo, aquí el 14% de la población es indígena y eh, se lo ve a lo indígena como lo otro por la reproducción de, el, de, de esta, este lenguaje de la jerarquía, eh, todo lo colonial que tenemos, como nuestras, nuestras prácticas de decolonizar y se lo ve a lo indígena como lo otro y por ejemplo, eh, Recuerdo, digamos, eh, a la, las formas en las que nosotros acá festejamos los raimis, eh, las fiestas del, de las cosechas y todos estos temas, se lo folcloriza. Entonces, como que viene también este término que a mí me parece que es muy europeo el, y, o, o como muy eurocéntrico, tal vez, el, el, la de la apropiación. O sea, yo creo que el, el, como vivir las fiestas, como vivir la, lo andino, eh, es parte de, de, de sentirnos parte de este territorio. Pero hay como esta discusión en lo urbano, en lo mestizo, que eso no es nuestro, como que eso es una apropiación cultural. Entonces, no sé cómo, si, es que, si es que puedes como decir algo. Bueno, es que lo que pasa es que la indigenidad está en disputa. O sea, supone una gran plusvalía simbólica la apropiación de la indianidad por el Estado, por ejemplo, supone la apropiación de el trabajo simbólico gratuito, por eso yo le llamo plusvalía simbólica, incorporado en la cultura, en las prácticas, en el idioma. Entonces hay un capital simbólico que es apropiado y se transforma en plusvalía en el manos del Estado, que es expropiada a generaciones de generaciones de creadores culturales indígena, ¿no es cierto? Entonces, además, se propone una idea uniformizada de indio, ¿no? De algún modo hay un indio disfrazado, un indio para la foto, para, el, para la foto estatal, para la autoimagen estatal, pero de algún modo para la imagen externa también. Son famosos los dobles discursos de Evo Morales, que defiende a la Pachamama en los foros internacionales, y aquí mete eh, bulldozers para hacer carreteras en medio de reservas indígenas eh, o, o quiere abrir reservas indígenas a la explotación petrolera, ¿no? Entonces, eh, permanentemente se legitiman con lo indio, ¿no? O sea, la carretera al Timis la volvieron una pelea entre indios cuando en realidad era una pelea entre cocaleros capitalistas e indígenas, ¿no? aunque tengan el mismo color de la piel, incluso aunque hablen el mismo idioma. No sé si te satisface. Nada, gracias. I don't see another hand, but just to offer another incidence of this. Um, in the US right now, there's a push to bring into question the identity of uh, native populations and forcing them to prove that they're indigenous folks um, <clears throat> with a right, written word, right? Written documentation. And <clears throat> it's just another example of like using these Western tools to like undermine the identity, the, <clears throat> the rights that they have been granted or given, right, through these institutions. Um, and yeah, there's some beautiful podcasts being done about this work that I can drop into the chat, but definitely hard to witness and know how to counter, <clears throat> how to counter, how to fight, right? No he entendido nada. I didn't understand what you want to say or ask? <clears throat> oh, <clears throat> I was just bringing into the space that in the US there's a similar effort by the government and corporations to undermine the power of, you know, indigenous or native populations in the US by taking away their land and, um, you know, their rights as, that they have as official indigenous tribes <clears throat> through the US government. Um, And it's being done by 
saying that they have to prove, they have to like go back hundreds of years to prove that they are an indigenous person based on like historical documents that they like have right to the land that they're now occupying. Um, so just bringing in that it's like <clears throat> this government using the power that they have and the, the ways of relating to the world that they have to further like wield power or like strip away rights of different populations. Uh-huh. Well, the indigenous situation is very diverse in the Americas. So in the US, for example, I can't hear you. I'm not sure I really understood, but I would say that the heterogeneity of the situations of the indigenous peoples. No, uh, are you speaking? Joel is translating. Uh, Joel está traduciendo. Estás traduciendo? Sí. Okay. okay. <laughs> Al castellano, pero I'm speaking in English. Está haciendo las dos traducciones. Ah, well, those, okay, so I would think that every in every situation there are different power relations um, between indigenous people, other people, and the state. So in this triangulation, there is a lot of diversity. You know, in ex in general, there has been an advance in the in the new constitutions in Colombia, Ecuador, and Bolivia. The recognition of uh, indigenous rights uh, in various spheres, especially indigenous justice and indigenous territory, and also the uh, cultural autonomy. So I think the difference the difference is in the political, no? O sea, the political power of the indigenous people is very, very big in Bolivia, especially the Aymara people, but it's a power um, rather devoid of a true indigenous content. It, 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 um, it borrows indigenous symbols, but from a Western point of view, a dominant Marxist point of view in Bolivia has derived in the minorization of indigenous majorities. And thus the political strength of these uh, people has, has become uh, much less strong, much weaker. And uh, so it's, it's a symbolism, but devoid of content. content uh? Uh, so I think that's rather different than the situation in Colombia or, the, or in Brazil. In Brazil, for example, there is like the preservation of a very, very antique and pure waves of view in the world, uh, taking, for example, hallucinogenic substances and all that is very little contaminated. But um, in Bolivia, it's not the case. It, the indigenous are very, very acculturated. And so they are very prone to see themselves reflected in the mirror of the state. Okay, I think that's all, isn't it? Well, I think.